Hello, thank you for inviting me to uh, give a plenary talk. Uh, I'm very honored to talk to you today about free nitride functional materials for emerging photonic applications. Uh, this work was performed at the University of California, Santa Barbara, along with the group uh, of uh, my colleagues, uh, Professor James Speck, uh, Professor Umesh Mishra, and Suji Nakamura, along with a very strong group of uh, students and postdocs. So today, uh, I'll talk to you really about what we think is the indium gallium nitride uh, material system has really enabled a lot of achievements in photonics lately. But uh, what we believe is, is now a really exciting new area is what's called the uh, display area is in the field of micro LEDs. And in there, our achievements, uh, as you know, uh, LEDs for, for LED light bulbs are about 100 microns in diameter. But in order to use the three nitrides for displays, you need to reduce their size. So over the last uh, several years, we have been uh, working hard to reduce the size of the, uh, the LED. And I'm proud to point out that we've now gone from 100 microns uh, down to 10 microns a few years ago. And to this year, now we're able to do one micron uh, diameter indium gallium nitride micro LEDs, which is the kind of size you need if you're going to make augmented reality. 10 microns, by the way, is pretty good uh, size for TVs and such. And with the advent of micro LED TVs coming from Samsung and LG and Sony, among others, we think this is going to be a, a very hot research area for several uh, years to come. Uh, some of our contributions to the field have been uh, proving that uh, passivation of the sidewall, particularly with the atomic layer deposition, has proven to be one of the key uh, ways we've improved the external quantum efficiency of our uh, three nitride materials. Finally, I'll show you some recent work in which we've done uh, red indium gallium uh, nitride micro LEDs. As shown down here, you can see if you can get red, green, and blue for one material system, that will make it easier for integration on the same substrate. Uh, another way to integrate the LEDs is to stack them with tunnel junctions. So recently we, we've done some novel work in making tunnel junctions in uh, gallium nitride to make um, basically micro LEDs with stacked cascaded tunnel junctions. Finally, I think one of the biggest areas that material scientists have to solve is what is the mass transfer method uh, to uh, deposit these micro LEDs on backplanes and transparent substrates. And I'll show you uh, the technique we use to, to do that. Finally, looking even further to the future, I'll touch a little bit on the use of uh, three nitride uh, la lasers, actually to get uh, not only lighting, but display level quantities of light. So that's the outline for my plenary talk today. So let's, uh, let's get into it. So as you know, the uh, three nitride materials, uh, better known as the gallium nitride based semiconductors has emerged over the last uh, two decades to really have uh, numerous applications. Um, now, not only are they in photonics, uh, but also in electronics and power devices. Uh, they've started to show up in inverters and electric vehicles. However, today I will focus on the photonic applications, which is the uh, light emitting diode applications and the laser diode applications. In particular, I'll focus on the micro LED application uh, because I believe that in the short term, there's a lot of promise for both uh, improving the display quantity, the brightness and uh, the flexible nature of of putting these micro LEDs uh, on various uh, backplanes allow you to now think of mobile uses as well. Uh, Touch a little bit also on the laser lighting aspect of it, in particular, the ability to generate uh, light for displays, but also even to communicate with, uh, with these three dye and trade materials. Now there's kind of two sets of markets demands for micro LEDs. And really where we see the uh, emerging area of augmented or mixed reality uh, displays needs sizes of LEDs now down to two microns to meet the size requirement. And that's because you need to get a very high density, pixel density to get into the uh, augmented reality. And so we see it generally as you, as you go to up to 5,000 pixels per inch, uh, you need these higher uh, number of pixel counts, subsequently smaller sizes. Other markets uh, that that uh, that I think are don't need as, as tough of uh, the two microns that is ten microns and higher could be smartphones, uh, laptops, and TVs. Uh, currently, micro LED TVs on the market are about forty microns actually in size. So it just depends on the application area, but we see uh, generally a, a very strong demand to decrease the size. Another reason that you want to decrease the size uh, of the micro LED is cost. 
obviously, uh, if you can get dimensions below 10 microns, uh, down to five microns, this is uh, will help with the cost per display. And these are some estimates from uh, Vico uh, in the Society for Information Displays Digest here, uh, which just points out what the cost for display is, uh, depending on the uh, size of the micro LED. So we can see 10 micron uh, uh, micro LEDs are, are still quite costly, over $60 per display. But if we can uh, get down to five and three microns, which we did last year uh, with our uh, driving the size down, you can see the cost per display uh, drops dramatically. And that is because you use the epi area more efficiently and uh, you know much more efficiently. Uh, a three micron uh, LED is basically, since it goes as the square, is, is basically uh, nine times lower in terms of the cost uh, to produce it. Likewise, for the uh, TV, where the cost can be quite high, uh, we've seen some very high uh, prices for the 40 micron micro LEDs, uh, you know, cost approaching $100,000 uh, per display. But as you can see, as we get the size of the micro uh, LED down, the cost drop as well. Here though, the key is going to be maintaining the efficiency, external quantum efficiency, as you drive the sizes down, in addition to keep the transfer cost low. So as we can see, size really dominates a lot of the applications of these three nitride materials. Uh, the other question is, uh, what materials should we use? So currently, uh, we're using for the blue is indium gallium nitride, uh, shown here, which has very high external quantum efficiencies. And by the way, these are numbers for regular size LEDs, not the micro LEDs. So uh, these are for basically 100 microns and larger. And for the red, we're using aluminum gallium indium phosphide, but also many groups are considering the indium gallium nitride, because as you can see by this line here, these three red dots, as we push into the so-called green gap here, with the nitrides, there's been a rapid improvement in efficiencies to the point that green is for sure going to be uh, indium gallium nitride, but the real battle is now being fought over the red, and, and we believe there's advantages to making a micro display out of one color, out of one material system. So one of those reasons is that the uh, aluminum gallium indium phosphide micro LEDs, the external quantum efficiencies have historically been shown to uh, reduce the, uh, as you reduce the size, the external quantum efficiency, or what I'll call the EQE from here on out, drastically reduces with size. So this is not only seen by our group, but here's some recent data from uh, JTO, from Optics Express showing you, even as you go from 350 by 350 microns down to 15 microns, the uh, efficiency tanks pretty quickly, uh, which was seen what was similar uh, to, to work seen you know, further in the past. And we indeed still see these fairly strong drop off in efficiency when you get to around 40, 50 microns. And that is because the surface recombination in the gallium arsenide material system is uh, much faster than that in, in the nitrides. Now the indium gallium nitrides uh, basically have a promising characteristic is that you can drive them to pretty high current densities. However, uh, they also initially showed some fairly strong drops in the EQE with size and also a fairly what we call droop as you go to higher current densities, which you might need for TV applications on the order of uh, greater than 100 amp per square. In fact, the efficiency drops uh, by about 30% from its peak. So this is kind of the status of the research uh, over five years ago, and we entered the field and along with others, tried to understand what was going on with the nitrides. So the efficiencies were low, uh, primarily also because of the way the light was collected, and that's out the backside. So we, uh, we went around to now putting the omnidirectional reflector in here. This is then the kind of a, the basis structure of our micro LEDs. And we looked at what were the uh, factors causing this decrease in efficiency as the size was reduced. So here shows uh, our first attempt at micro LEDs going from 100 micron to 80, 60, 40, 20, and in 10. And, and what you can see is as you start getting around 20 and 10, the brightness of the LED is, is being reduced substantially. And so we looked at this uh, for various uh, ways of, of, of passivating the sidewall. And so we'll have the black line here as reference. And what in particular I want you to point out is this is now leakage current. That is the amount of current which uh, does not go through the junction, but we believe leaks either around the sidewalls or through the junction. And as you can see, when you're at 100 by 100 micron LEDs, the, Sidewall leakage isn't too bad, but all these uh, processes we tried 
as you went through smaller dimensions, the leakage current density uh, rose dramatically. And that's because the, the sidewall perimeter area as a function of total area is, is being increased. And so in particular, what we looked at is basically the uh, looking at uh, what we call atomic layer deposition with a HF treatment basically gave you a fairly good recovery, not all the way, but almost a factor of uh, two orders of magnitude better than the reference and much better than the standard in the industry, which is PEC, uh, PECVD uh, deposition of silicon dioxide. And in fact, the PECVD was one of the worst ones. So this decrease in PQE, we believe, is primarily due to the sidewall defects which form when you're making the MESA. And this is even more dramatic if we look at these uh, two different LED sizes of 100 by 100 versus 20 by 20. And so the reference LED has uh, basically no passivation on it. If we do uh, plasma enhanced uh, CVD uh, passivation, you can see 40 microns uh, or 100 by 100 micron. It's, it's not too bad, but when a real dramatic drop in EQE happens is when you go to these smaller dimensions and you see it 20 by 20, that actually the PECVD one is now much worse <clears throat> than the uh, reference LED sample. In fact, at 20 milliamps or 20 amp per square centimeter, it's only got an EQE of about 10%. So that's like a fourfold drop uh, from when it was at the larger size. But you can see by putting a, a ALD passivation, we were able to significantly increase the efficiency of the micro LED and uh, decrease the, uh, the drop in efficiency that you see when making the LED smaller. That was some work from Matt Wan. So uh, furthermore, we've further proved that for a variety of sizes now going from 100 to 10 microns, we're now able to get fairly uh, consistent EQEs. There's still a drop in efficiency as you go to smaller, but it basically only drops from about 47 to now about 40%. Uh, percent. So for 10 microns, this is still one of the highest EQEs we believe that's been reported in literature of 42%. And we, again, believe that's primarily due to the reduction in sidewall damage in our micro LEDs. Now, going even further, um, one of our, our graduate students, uh, Jordan Smith and, and Ryan Lay, have worked at developing a fabrication process, which is even smaller than the uh, 10 micron LEDs. And that is as we push towards one micron and, uh, and, and five to one micron in size. We use a self-aligned micro LED process, which is shown here. <clears throat> First step is to pattern the uh, MESA size with a bilayer hard mask. And then uh, we've deposited ITO here on this uh, mask, which is right here. This is the P contact. Then we etch uh, the ITO in the MESA. And then we come in with a uh, KOH treatment and undercut the hard mask. Uh, then we deposit our ALD thin ALD passivation uh, over everything, which we showed covers up the sidewalls here as well. Then do a thicker dielectric passivation uh, followed uh, on top of the ALD. Then remove this hard mask here to deposit the peak contact. So now we have the, uh, the etched vias here, the end contact's gonna go down here and the peak contact can go up here. So this is our self-aligned five micron and smaller micro LED process. Now uh, we can look a little bit more in detail here, uh, but basically this is uh, fairly straightforward. It's three total lithographies and uh, we've just used conventional processing with the addition of the LD sidewall passivation. So you could see here, this is for a uh, one micron uh, micro LED. You could see fairly bright blue luminescence even at room uh, under room lighting conditions. So, uh, we believe this to be some of the smallest micro LEDs with good external quantum efficiency that have been demonstrated. Now, just measuring the EQE of those bare chip, so this is not in an integrating sphere or not packaged, that is uh, just collecting the light from the backside of the, the wafer uh, with a uh, photo detector and a power meter close to it. We're able to then see that for the uh, unpassivated devices, uh, that's just sputtered aluminum oxide only without the uh, ALD and etching it. You could see as you go from 30 microns to one microns, you get a fairly strong efficiency drop from 6% to 2%. However, using the passivation methods uh, developed uh, in our group with where you do a KOH etch followed by ALD and then the sputtered AL203, you could see we were able to uh, recover quite a bit of the efficiency uh, as in the smaller one micron device sizes as well. 
And so uh, again, they're not as good as the bigger devices, which were much higher efficiency, but we're able to get fairly respectable now EQEs, even down to sizes as small as one micron. Um, furthermore, you can see that the passivation on here, the red line shows you no passivation, and then the black uh, square is showing you here that the KOH and ALD passivation increased EQE for all sizes of micro LEDs. Again, this EQE is here is, is somewhat relative in that it's not in an integrating sphere. If we put these LEDs in an integrating sphere, this number would be probably a factor of three to four higher, uh, so more like 30% uh, or so. But you still see that the EQE starts to drop off pretty dramatically around 10 microns. So there's still a lot more research to improve efficiencies in this lower uh, MESA diameter sizes. Now, the final effort I, I'd said, we, that's for blue and, and green, is to try to get red. And um, approach we've done uh, in some work supported by the Office of Naval Research and then done with, in collaboration with Umesh Mishra's group, some very nice work from Shubra um, Pasayat, who's demonstrated that if we can grow the uh, mesas on terms of uh, in terms of uh, indium, and we put those on top of uh, porous gallium nitride, that is gallium nitride, which has pores it, etched in it, we can get some relaxation in the indium gallium nitride. And this graph shows you um, basically the voltage apply corresponds to how porous this gallium nitride is. We're able to show for fin widths as small as two microns, we can get almost 100% relaxation. Even for five microns, we're getting about 80%. And so uh, we've applied this to some uh, micro LEDs. So this is a paper that uh, Shubra published uh, last year in Applied Physics Letter, showing you uh, basically where to compare some uh, efficiencies and wavelengths of LEDs made on this uh, material here. Uh, we're gonna compare a reference non-porous device. By non-porous, it means the N plus gallium nitride is not etched, so it does not have any pores in it, versus uh, porous gallium nitride in which we've etched the gallium nitride here to make uh, pores in it, and then re regrown the uh, strain device on top of that. And then uh, further sizes, we've changed the uh, tile size here from eight to 20 microns, because the smaller it is, we expect more relaxation as shown on the earlier plot. And indeed, uh, growing all these devices in the reactor at the same time, so we know the emissivity growth conditions are the same, we see a pretty dramatic shift in the wavelength from the non-porous device is about uh, 490 to 500 nanometers. So that's actually in the what's called the aqua or blue-green spectrum. Basically, you get a, a huge shift over a 50 to 60 nanometer shift all the way into the uh, green, yellow-green region of the spectrum just by growing on porous gallium nitride. And that is because the indium gallium nitride on top here is relaxed. And that not only incorporates more indium in the quantum balls, but also reduces what's called the quantum confined Stark effect. So basically, conclusion here is that tile size, as you decrease it, the degree of relaxation goes up. So the composition in the indium and the quantum oil goes up and also the wavelength gets longer. So furthermore, we varied the uh, indium composition and the underlayer layer here, we changed it from 4% to 9%. And uh, that also shows you that we can shift the wavelength even further because higher indium makes the lattice constant larger. Therefore, the composition in the quantum well also goes up. And this was of even more dramatic effect uh, than the, even the size effect. Here you can see we went from the green region and now we're actually in the red region of the spectrum, 620 uh, for devices grown at the same time. And uh, you can see the electroluminescence. However, the efficiencies on the order of about 1% EQE. So we still need a long way to go to improve the red uh, red indium gallium nitride micro LED emitters. So the final area of micro LED research I'll touch on is the uh, what's called the selective area growth method to get good tunnel junctions. And so what the tunnel junction uh, basically is, is it lets you to uh, basically go with a, uh, an N layer here followed by P and then followed by an N layer. And this will let you uh, not only go with just one contact scheme, that is everything's an N-type contact, but you can also think of stacking LEDs on top of each other of, of different color. And one of the problems, uh, as you know, that uh, occurs in gallium nitride, or maybe you don't know, is that hydrogen will passivate the P-type material and render it uh, useless. 
So you need to be able to let the hydrogen diffuse out through the, uh, through the uh, gallium nitride. Now, what you may not know is uh, hydrogen does not through, uh, diffuse through any kind of N-type gallium nitride. So what you have to do is you have to etch holes in the substrate. And in this case, what we decided to do is when we regrew the N-type is to make a silicon dioxide mask. And so what the selective area growth does is when you grow the P and then the N, that will let you then further, uh, after you remove the silicon dioxide mask with the HF, will give a pathway for the hydrogen to diffuse out. So this is what the uh, mass looks like for a selective area growth for tunnel junction micro LEDs. Uh, this one just shows a 60 uh, by 60 micron uh, micro LED because we want to make sure we could get tunnel junctions to work. And we varied the spacing of these, uh, these holes, selective area growths from 2.5 to 5 to 7.5. And then uh, this is what the micro LEDs look like. We also did a variety of sizes from 20, 60, and 80. And you can see that's a selective area growth. Micro LEDs look very good in uniform. And then this one shows you then the remarkable difference uh, that you get with employing this selective area growth technique when trying tunnel junctions. Uh, here we're trying to get a, a green LED. And what you see is that the reference tunnel junction without any selective area growth, without any of those holes uh, needed to grow uh, through, you could see that you only get luminescence near the uh, edges of the LED. And I apologize, you also see this hole pattern here. That's not from the selective area growth hole. This is from the pattern sapphire substrate that we grow on. When you do put selective area growth holes in the tunnel junction, that gives you much brighter luminescence and you get uniform emission across the whole uh, uh, PN diode. So that means that the, the uh, P-type gallium nitride is fully active and the selective area growth aperture was very helpful for the removal of hydrogen atoms. So again, let's look at the various sizes here. This is the reference tunnel junction without the hole. You can see very little luminescence and what is coming out is near the edges, putting in the selective area growth holes you can see we get very uh, uniform uh, green emission from all the micro LEDs all the way down from 100 to 20. Furthermore, uh, in the tunnel junction, voltage is, is very important. And so what this view graph over here shows you is the standard uh, LED, not tunnel junction, ITO is the standard of an industry. You'd expect to see around three volts for the, uh, the voltage of the tunnel junction around 60 uh, amperes per centimeter. What you can see is the red line here shows the selective area growth tunnel junction is uh, pretty good. It's about 3.3. .3, so it means we're, we're giving about a 0.3 volt penalty, but this is much improved to the reference tunnel junction LEDs, which are shown here in which the voltage is, is more like five volts. Uh, correspondingly, this plot shows you that reference tunnel junctions have had this problem of having significantly higher voltages than non-tunnel junction LEDs going from 3.6 all the way up to 4.5 volts. But once we've gone with selective area growth technique, you can see we almost get size independence in the tunnel junction LED voltage. Uh, and that is because we're now activating almost the whole P layer. So, so this was a nice, some nice work from Pan Pan Lee that was recently published in Optics Express. Okay, so now we've got our micro LEDs of the three uh, colors, red, green, and blue. Um, and we'd like to deposit those on a host substrate. So this is, I think, one of the hardest manufacturing challenges of the micro LED uh, displays is how do you get the micro LEDs off the host substrates? And so uh, the technique uh, that most people use is laser liftoff. However, the technique that we've decided on, which is a little less damaging than laser liftoff is something called PEC, which stands for photoelectrochemical etching. And so this is a sacrificial etch, which we put a proprietary layer here and then grow the LED on, uh, and then we etch it off. So we etch that off in a uh, basically a selective chemistry uh, and uh, remove the micro LEDs. So first uh, have to have these micro LEDs on a substrate. So the way we do that is we grow a sacrificial layer here under the LED. We then have the micro LEDs in, in uh, ridges here. And they've got two little anchors on them here. Again, PEC etch stands for photoelectrochemicals. So that means you got to have a photo or photons. The photons we use to sacrifice the sacrificial layer is, uh, is a, a 400 nanometer near UV light. And uh, we illuminate the LEDs. 
And as long as you have these LEDs uh, fabricated to another substrate, we can then pull them off. And we basically then can pull the LED straight off the substrate. And so that's shown right here. So we use what's called a PDMS stamp uh, on top of that substrate and then do the selective area etch. And in this region here, you can see you've got all the micro LEDs on the PDMS stamp. Uh, yield is, is about 80%. You can see right here, there's a missing one that didn't lift off, but the, uh, the lifted off LED looks like this. Here's the two anchors that were holding it to the substrate. So once you've got them on this, this stamp, you can then transfer them to the back plane. Um, so in this case, we uh, basically lowered it on to an adhesive, which is cured at uh, under UV for one and a half hours. And then we slowly pull the PDMS stamp away. In this case, the substrate is a glass, uh, glass uh, back plane. And so the leftover uh, micro LEDs that were peeled off the stamp are left here. And just showing you here that the micro LEDs are robust. IV curves are very good. Uh, and then power output per, per LED is also fairly good. But these were blue micro LEDs showing you very good full with half max as well. So successfully transferred them from our sapphire substrate to glass transparent substrates. And we've done this for the other colors as well, red and green and blue. And so you could see now here's on a flexible substrate. In this case, we put them on a piece of plastic. We now have red, green and blue. In this case, we're using microprobes to get the spectra out. You can see we get very narrow uh, blue and green spectrum. The red is still a little bit broad for the nitrides, so we've got to work on that. But nevertheless, it's possible with the indium gallium nitride system then to make red, green, blue uh, micro LED displays. Okay, final uh, effort of our photonics I'll touch on is the laser effort. So this started out as uh, trying to get to very high power laser lighting. And the aspect here is that we can use uh, laser lighting in the building to transmit data to your, uh, your mobile phone or internet access for your uh, computer. And uh, it's coded, also could be used in the surgery room. Uh, airplanes, uh, you could use the lights up here for transmission to information to your display. Uh, so lots of applications also. Uh, under, underwater communications rely heavily on blue light. Uh, currently, everything has to be tethered to get communication between the subs and whatnot. You can also use sound waves, but those are very slow. So we'd like to use uh, blue laser light for a very high speed communication. So uh, basically, we've shown that you can use the, the laser to pump, uh, to pump phosphorus here. We can get over 83 lumens per watt uh, by pumping it. This is some work done in, in Germany. BMW has shown you can actually uh, pump phosphorus in and make car headlights with them. And so one of the advantages of this for the lighting aspect, as you can see, uh, where's the EQE of LEDs as similar to micro LEDs drops very quickly with efficiency. Uh, the efficiency drops quickly with current densities. Lasers have the opposite effect is that they're, they start out at low efficiency, but once lasing occurs, you get actually higher efficiency as you drive the current higher. And so lasers have a wider range of currents over which the efficiency is droop free. Now, uh, some early work we showed that you could actually get from a single laser enough light to do a light bulb. This is a thousand lumen light bulb, uh, which was 87 lumens per watt. And while LEDs are showing 150 uh, lumen per watt and higher, this is about half the efficiency I wanna point out if this is a single chip and almost all those LED demonstrations are 10 or 20 chips to get similar numbers of light. And so that's why one of the first applications for this laser lighting has actually been car headlights where they want a single spot of, of light. And uh, that's shown up here in, in the BMW, who I think was the first car to the market with laser headlights. I think Audi followed suit uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, nowadays, uh, several other car companies are, are looking at putting this into the car headlight. And that's mainly because when you have a single high brightness source of light, you get much higher increased nighttime visibility. This is uh, shown for an LED high beam, you can get out to about 150 yards, but an LED slash laser uh, accelerated or laser booster, you can get out to 700 meters. So that means uh, you can get much greater nighttime visibility with your headlights. And believe it or not, this is 
actually has less glare than the LED headlights. And you, so you can more direct the light on the road where you need it. And it has met all these safety regulations in the European market to be released. Now, where does display fit in this? It turns out you have a very bright uh, bulb here. It turns out you can now also use that for projection displays. And this one shows you a projection display which goes right up against the wall. And that's because you have such high spot brightness and it, you actually project the screen directly up uh, vertically away from the projector. That can only be done if you have a laser light source in it. So several companies uh, now have what's called laser projection TV going. And we think it's gonna actually now start going down into the market into more smaller displays. Uh, just showing you again the difference. Uh, this is a BMW car here. There's another one, this is an Audi uh, down here, just showing you the difference between LED uh, here, where you can only see out about 100, 200 yards, each one of these posts is put at 100 meters. Uh, over here with the laser booster, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you, they put something in the road here all the way. So much uh, better increased nighttime visibility is the big advantage of using laser lighting, which again is also uh, enabled by the gallium nitride material system. Uh, this just shows you where we are in terms of the output power. I showed you again, output uh, optical power and also the wall plug efficiency of the lasers has been improved over the last few years. Now it's around 35%. Uh, so final view graph I'll show you the laser is that the modulation frequency or the frequency response uh, can be much better with a, a, a laser versus an LED. So similar to fiber optic communication, which works at the infrared wavelengths, uh, the reason you don't use LED for fiber optics is because it's too slow, generally on the order of a few hundred megahertz. Laser, on the other hand, because it relies on stimulated emission, can be modulated much faster in the gigahertz range. And indeed, this one shows you here that we're able to get three gigahertz, uh, what's called the 3 dB bandwidth of modulation. And this is some joint work that uh, UCSB has done with uh, Cax and Kaust, which is uh, Professor Bunoy at Kaust in Saudi Arabia, along with uh, Dr. Al Yamani at the uh, Center for Nanostructures at uh, CAXT in, in Saudi Arabia. So very nice uh, work in which we made the lasers and they measured uh, the modulation frequencies. So I, I think that's it for my plenary talk. I hope I've, I've shown you that the uh, three nitrides are a very functional material. They've, they're have they starting to show up in even more applications than LED lighting. I think the next big one is gonna be this uh, red, green, blue application for micro displays. Uh, after that, we think the future for, for gallium nitride and lasers is just beginning to emerge. And hopefully after some hard work, we can start to see lasers and laser displays as well. Thank you for your time.